I'm Michael Lachlan, Executive Director of Outreach. We are committed to celebrating the LGBTQ Catholic experience, publishing essays, articles, and resources each week at our website, outreach.faith. We're excited now to bring you a variety of conversations with LGBTQ Catholics discussing a range of topics important to our community. Greg Krajewski, a gay filmmaker based in Chicago, developed this project for Outreach. Hi, Greg. Hi there, Mike. Greg, let me ask you, what is your goal with this project? Well, um, I'm really hoping to normalize and bring to the forefront LGBTQ Catholic stories. Um, When I was working in Catholic media, I spent a really long time, by nature of what we were doing, ignoring or avoiding or sometimes literally editing out the stories of queer Catholics from videos. And I now that I'm not in that space anymore and I have a little bit more freedom, um, I really want to elevate those voices. I'm hoping to continue to do this kind of work in the future as well. Yeah, we're glad you're doing this work and bringing some of these stories to outreach where we are consistently trying to elevate the LGBTQ Catholic experience. Uh, Who are you talking to today? Uh, Well, today I am talking to Eve Tushnet, who is a Catholic uh, lesbian author and speaker who's been working in this space for quite a while now. Um, In her own words, she works towards uh, gay or queer flourishing within Catholic obedience. You know, she and I don't necessarily see eye to eye on exactly how LGBTQ people are being called to live their lives, but the experiences of LGBTQ Catholics are as varied as the experiences of everyone else in the church. Uh, There isn't just one monolith, one type of person, uh, one way of doing things. So I really appreciated kind of getting into those differences and even where we find common ground and similarity. And even more important, uh, where we have this common dignity of our lived experiences. Um, so it was really a pleasure to talk to her about those things. Great. Well, we are committed to publishing a range of opinions and perspectives and experiences of LGBTQ Catholics. So I appreciate uh, you diving into this interview. Uh, if you enjoy the interview, uh, visit our website at outreach.faith, where you can sign up for weekly gospel reflections from Father James Martin, learn about our upcoming conferences, and get connected with our array of resources. Now, our discussion with Greg and Eve. The Catholic Church throughout the years has struggled with its messaging to LGBTQ people. As I grew and slowly began to come to terms with who I am, I sought out documents, encyclicals, analyses, anything that would speak to my lived reality as a sexual minority. I'm so grateful for the growing body of work in the church related to the LGBTQ community, both for people like me who are hungry to live their faith and also be true to themselves, but also for the world to see that the Catholic Church is for everyone, that it can be a welcoming and loving place for all. I spoke to Eve Tushnet, an author and speaker who has spent years engaging with these questions. What should the Catholic message to LGBTQ people be? How should that message be spread? And and what are some of the challenges in that? My name is Eve Tushnet. I'm 45. I have written uh, four books, two novels, and two books on gay Christian spiritual journeys, uh, directed especially at Catholics who uh, are trying to live uh, in accordance with the church's teachings and what are some of the kind of mm, things that other people will not tell you that you won't realize. Because I think as I did, a lot of people come into that attempt not actually knowing anyone else who's doing it and flail around and make a lot of mistakes. Uh, so I tried to sort of write the books that I wish that I had had. Um, I uh, last year co-founded a nonprofit called Building Catholic Futures that seeks to equip Catholic institutions to evangelize and catechize gay people of all ages. That's the sort of jargon mission. Uh, What it basically means is at every point that someone encounters uh, what they perceive as the voice of the church, those conversations can and frequently do go really badly, but sometimes they are actually really beautiful in ways that people, regardless of where they end up, look on later and say, that was a moment where I really encountered the love of God or the face of Jesus. So what can we do to make those moments more like that? Uh, And that's kind of the goal of the project. 
you mentioned already this this message you have, what you want to communicate to the world. Talk a little bit more about that first from your unique perspective um, as someone who would consider themselves part of the LGBTQ community. What What is this primary message you're trying to communicate um, through all the mediums that you work in? Yeah, I mean, I don't know that I necessarily would say that I have sort of a primary message because people's experience is so different. One of the catchphrases that I've used in trying to explain building Catholic futures to people, which I think no one else likes as much as I do, uh, is gay flourishing or queer flourishing within Catholic obedience. Because I feel like virtually nowhere are you going to find someone who's willing to say, like, yes, both of those things are what we're going for. It's a little that even in itself, though, is a little more kind of like relentlessly positive than I tend to be. Uh, You know, I don't think we can really promise people either complete flourishing or complete obedience. But I can say that, you know, what if those two things, what if the two parts of your identity that other people will tell you are in conflict and that you may have felt very painfully are in conflict can actually support one another? What if your journey toward self-acceptance and your journey toward like a deeper, more harmonious, more obedient relationship to the Catholic Church could actually come together? And I will say that that's been my experience, that whatever self-acceptance I really have gained uh, has been more because of my faith than in spite of it. And that does give me a lot of hope that that can be true for other people too. So is that where you believe your your desire to spread this comes from? Is Is it from your own personal experience of seeing where obedience and this flourishing can live together. I think so. Yeah. For me, from pretty early on, I started to ask, okay, like I, I'm a convert. So I converted to Catholicism when I was 19, uh, an age where people make excellent decisions generally. Um, and from pretty early on, I did find myself asking, okay, well, so if I'm not going to do, I was already out as a lesbian. If I'm not going to do like the normal things that people do in order to live out their lesbian identity or desires or longings, what am I going to do with them? Uh, I have to say that has proven to be a really fruitful question. I really want to encourage people to at least consider that that might be the question to ask themselves, even if they have a more quote unquote traditional or orthodox belief. That question led me to volunteer work. It led me to really throw myself into my friendships and especially uh, my relationship with my best friend. And then ultimately, more recently, I'm pursuing a covenant friendship or a covenant of kinship uh, with a woman here in California. And all those things are things that I did because I accepted and was grateful for my experience as a gay woman. And if I had instead been like, no, I have to flee that and view it as a source of temptation, I would have missed out on things that have been real, just like anchors and blessings in my spiritual life. In my experience, I understand, for example, my relationship with my parents is not super healthy because they do not agree with my current life situation in in my marriage. But I I understand that certainty. When I encounter Catholics of goodwill, uh, which in in my definition is is people who really want what's best for others. Um, I understand why certainty is so helpful. Um, I know what the church teaches. I know why they teach it. And if you stray from that, uh, uh, I, I don't understand why anyone would want to stray from that. I'm curious where your certainty comes from f- from from your your LGBTQ side. Um, where, where I understand the certainty of the church, there's all these teachings, there's all these saints, it's coming forever. Where does the certainty come from on the other end for you? Interesting. Yeah. Well, first, I'm, I'm sorry about you. Take care of that about your parents. I hope with time they can also see better where you are coming from and the love that you're experiencing. You know, for me, it really has been, I guess, experience. Um, I came out pretty early. I was either 12 or 13 uh, in the early 90s. And got to uh, was got to know other gay people. I went to a gay a sexual minority youth group. Uh, my best friend, who was also gay, uh, and I co-founded our school's Gay Straight Alliance. Like, you know, dated girls. Like, you end up seeing two girls. I don't want to make this sound more like exciting than it was. Um, and I just I learned a lot through that. I I met people who were leading much harder lives than I was. Uh, 
I had a lot of kind of confrontations with areas where I needed to grow and change. I made a lot, I did a lot of dumb stuff that I needed to learn from and people were often very patient with me. And I also knew that a lot of what I was responding to was beauty, that like physical beauty was really important to me. It was a huge part of my conversion, uh, the beauty of the physical world. And one moment where I really, that, that felt like a moment where you really perceive kind of a, like a transcendental beauty. Uh, there were a lot of, some of them were weird, right? But one of them was a beautiful woman coming out from in a darkened room into like, you know, candlelight or whatever. And I saw her face and I was like, there's something, you know, there's something more here. Like there's something, this is pointing me toward a true beauty. It was very much like if you read the symposium, it was very standard of like ladder of love that the beauty of the human body was real and also was pointing beyond itself uh, to say there's a meaning to this also. And so given all of that, I didn't have basically any negative associations with being gay. Uh, I grew up in a very progressive environment. Uh, my parents had gay friends when I was growing up. In the absence of all of that, you probably could have persuaded me uh, that it was bad to be gay if, but I'm, but like you would have had to try and I'm glad that no one did. Like I was at a very sort of like vulnerable age where I was, you know, making a lot of intense life changes without thinking about them enough. Uh, but it would, I think it would have been hard. I, I honestly don't know if anyone could have really persuaded me that those experiences had been in some way fake or misleading uh, just because there had been kind of a lot of them where it seemed clear to me that there was something to be grateful for in that experience. I, I feel like there's been times in my life where I felt very similar things. Um, and it's that experience that is, is where my personal certainty comes from my experience with, um, the different relationships and encounters I've had and, and how they've combined with different parts of my life. Um, especially my relationship with God and, and some very formative things that happened post-college. There is, there tends to be this a little bit of resistance from, again, we'll say Catholics of goodwill, of wanting to hear that experience, um, whether or not it is uh, in line with the church or not. There seems to be a resistance to want to to accept those experiences as real or from God. Where, where do those experiences belong in the narrative? Like how, how should those stories be told in the church? Hmm. It, to me, it's really like it depends on the setting, right? Like in some true way, right? Uh, and that could mean just, as you say, that can be people who are not seeking to live in accordance with the church, or it could be people who are, but whatever is, is actually true to the best of their understanding. In terms of kind of, I don't know, a conceptual framework, an analogy that I think about a lot that's been illuminating for me, I don't know if this is like, opening a separate can of worms, but the church's relationship to the Jewish people. So I was raised more or less Reformed Jewish, uh, somewhere between secular and Reformed Jewish. And it has been kind of striking to see some of the parallels. Uh, if you read something like Nostra Aetate, the document of the Second Vatican Council on relations with non-Christian religions, they're like very upfront talking about the beauty and holiness found in these religions, which is not you know, the way that you would expect the church to speak, and certainly not the way that it has spoken uh, in the past. And yet, that's also a real part of our actual faith, sort of seeing the goodness, truth, and beauty, and beauty, even in experiences that people have in other paths and saying all of that has to come from our God somehow. I don't, I'm, I'm not a theologian, so I don't, you know, I would hesitate to go too far on what that all means. But it, one thing that was really fascinating to me and possibly speaks to your point is that the first kind of like thing that Building Catholic Futures did was bring together 10 uh, people in the sort of wide spectrum, gay, bi, same-sex attracted, people identified in various ways, all together who were trying to live in accordance with church teaching and had some degree of like experience of leadership in that world. And just get us all talking about different questions. My co-founder, Keith Wildenberg, kind of facilitated this. And one of the things that was really striking to me that came out of that weekend was how many of us, when Keith asked us to name kind of like, how did you learn about, I forget how he even phrased it, but it was basically like, 
what were your sources of self-understanding uh, as a gay person? Lots of us named as touchstones that we still look back on with a lot of gratitude and like, this was right. This is what I needed. People who are coming either from the secular gay world or from what you might call the dissenting gay Catholic world, uh, figures like Andrew Sullivan's essays on friendship or, uh, which for me was also huge. It was where I discovered a lot of the kind of Christian history of friendship or other people who, you know, we may have taken a different path within the church, but we needed those people. Like they were really important to us in helping us understand our own journeys. Um, and that gives me a lot of hope for, for many reasons. One of which is that we can kind of mm, give to one another uh, across some of these divides that we may think are, uh, would prohibit that. The, the context of, of, of where I find some of the, the struggles in this communication of this story is in, again, understanding what the church is teaching. So, for example, my parents, they, they love me. They want what's best for me. And they see what I'm doing as, like, I am in a state of mortal sin, which means I am going to hell. I've, I have separated myself from God, which is the most dangerous thing you can do. I think the space that you're creating is really interesting because it is such a unique perspective, which is weird in some way because it shouldn't be. And it should be very much embraced by by the Catholic Church as a whole. But I can see why, say, a pastor would rather not mention anything at all than, than open the door a little bit and have the floodgates come in and suddenly people are going to hell. Um, I'm wondering if, you, if you've experienced either instances where the church has, has either, I say the church, you know, there's laity, there's, there's all these different levels, but instances where you have gotten pushback um, and how would you respond to that? How would you respond to this kind of logical fallacy of a slippery slope where like, if you open the door at all to these stories or to welcome, you're suddenly inviting in hell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, so where I most often would say that I hear that kind of critique, it's framed in terms of scandal. Are you giving scandal? Um, and I guess what's so striking to me and painful is that it's really obvious if you talk to a lot of queer people that not being open to those stories and not trying to understand them also gives scandal. Uh, that like, yeah, okay. If you, you know, there are things that you can do, like, you know, the, the, uh, the Pope's or uh, the Vatican statement on blessing same-sex couples may lead people to think that the church does something it doesn't do or, you know, has changed its doctrine in ways that it hasn't. On the other hand, you know, when there were headlines about the Vatican refusing to bless same-sex couples, that also sent a message that is not true about what Catholic doctrine is, that, you know, that led a lot of people to think the church doesn't have any place for gay people. The church doesn't want gay people there. The church doesn't see anything good in the life of a gay couple. That too creates its own scandal and leads people into despair, which let me tell you is also a sin. And that I think is something that once you point it out, interestingly, many people can say, oh yes, I can see how that would be true. But people feel very protective toward the church. This is something I've noticed, and it really is across sexual orientations and across relationships to the Catholic Church, is that wherever you are on the issue of faith and sexuality or Catholic faith and LGBT people feels very hard won to you. And there's often a lot, there's a sort of like iceberg metaphor thing, right, where there's a lot of actual pain hidden beneath the surface. And it may be in unexpected places. I remember the first time I really noticed this, I was on a retreat where people discuss kind of the intersection of Catholic faith and LGBT experience. And one of the people there, uh, a heterosexual woman who was coming from a very, I, th I think she'd be okay with this language, conservative or traditional sexual ethic, uh, was explaining that it was genuinely 
distressing for her to be in this group with Christian gay people who supported gay marriage within the church uh, and other things that she disagreed with. And as she sort of articulated, she was clear, like visibly distressed, as she articulated where it was coming from, it was that she had seen so many people be hurt by the sexual revolution, by the sort of like overturning of, I guess, you, of, of sort of a, an, a kind of order in sexuality. And for her, the gay rights movement as such, or the gay liberation movement as such, felt like it was coming out of that impulse. And so although those experiences hadn't had anything to do with same-sex desire, it was all about, you know, the experiences of heterosexuals or people behaving heterosexually. It had caused so much pain that she was like, how can you not know that you shouldn't go down this road? And that was definitely, that was very eye-opening for me and is part of a pattern where people are not necessarily, like she was unusually, I think, aware of how much personal pain was driving her reactions and I think for many people, obviously, the pain of being rejected by your family when you came out, the pain of not being you know, recognized in your relationship with your partner, the, and, and on the other side, the pain of feeling like you're trying to raise kids in a world that is hostile to your faith or feeling like there's nothing you can do to really kind of like give your kids the protection that you feel they need. I personally am like, yeah, you can't do that because your kids also will be having these experiences and they too need some language to articulate it. But I guess what I'm saying is that part of the reason these questions are so difficult uh, or these conversations are so difficult is that everyone is defending something, not just presenting a position, but defending like what they feel is uh, a threatened good. That's exactly right. Where do you see the work that you do in in trying to move the needle, whatever that needle is in whatever direction? Or are you just sharing your story and being authentic and and maybe that's that's what's gonna do it? No, I mean, no, I do think I, I I think that's I'm sure that's a part of it, but I would say the biggest thing is uh, trying to actually, listen to a really wide range of experiences. This is something that Building Catholic Futures has leaned on pretty heavily of trying to say, ideally, everything that we do and say is coming not just from our own personal experience, but from hundreds of conversations, you know, with hundreds of people who are in different positions regarding this conversation, have had different experiences, end up in different places, and trying to draw from all of those to say, what do we wish these conversations had looked like a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And how can those lessons be brought into kind of like the present day? It's interesting. I wrote one of the resources that we're working on is a guide for parents. And this is not a guide for parents whose kids come out because there are like fairly good guides for that already. But more on I'm trying to be a good Catholic parent and not a jerk, but my kids are seeing stuff on the playground and on TikTok and whatever that feel weird that I don't feel like I'm equipped to handle. I didn't think we'd have to have this conversation at this age. They're saying stuff that I feel like, you know, I'm over, in over my head and would like some guidance. What does it all mean? And the materials that are out there for the kind of like concerned mom can be very bad. <laughs> We, so we created this thing that we're, we're, it's in draft form. It can, I, I actually feel pretty good about where it's at right now, but we've, we've shown it to parents, kids, you know, people in a bunch of, in different positions. And the first version of it was story focused. It was each principle that we were trying to convey was told through the personal story of a real uh, gay Catholic and specifically one who was currently uh, doing their best to practice church teaching. Uh, I I thought that might be powerful and persuasive of like these people are real, they're out there and like you know they too have had some experiences that overlap with the sort of like mainstream or secular gay experience in ways that are important. In the end we scrapped all but one of those uh, because it turned out that ultimately there's there's ways to convey 
the texture of a personal story and sort of like, what are the things that come out when you listen to hundreds of them? Uh, more so than any one individual, which you can only give in very edited snippets in this kind of resource anyway. So what turned out to be more important for us was to make it, to take those, all the conversations that had with all the people that had led up to that being the principle that we wanted to convey and just saying it. Be like, I understand like you have a million chores to do right now. You're probably like on the phone with five different people at this very moment. Like here's the bottom line and it's coming out of those personal experiences. And I think we do convey that reality, but you know, we're not going to make you listen to someone telling you their story if that's not the core of what we're saying. And I guess that's, I don't know if that, I don't think that is a statement about the limits of personal experience, but more, you simultaneously have to build trust and also not say unnecessary things. And that was what we were struggling with in the first draft. You want people to be confident that what you're saying is simultaneously worth their time and also respectful of their time, uh, especially for people like parents who are overextended most of the time anyway. The personal story is powerful. It's the core. It's, I mean, the gospels are a personal story, right? Like following the human person, the image of God. At the same time, there probably is a personal story to illustrate almost anything, like any possible perspective, including very crazy ones. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I have a strong point other than that there are, there's a limit to anecdata, which I get in some level, all statistics are just a big pile up of anecdata, but in storytelling, sim well, simultaneously, you can get a personal story that reflects absolutely any position. And also, no personal story fully reflects whatever position it is that you're ultimately trying to come to. Because all the stories are messy and there will be other things. And you'll have to sort of like navigate. Well, okay, you know, to take a really obvious example that comes up a lot. Well, okay, this person did become super, super depressed after their parents said a bunch of anti-gay stuff when they came out. But also they'd been depressed for a long time anyway. You know, like they, their grandmother just died. You know, there's a lot in the texture there. And you, if you want to uh, dismiss the personal story, you can say, well, we should look at that part. Uh, when in reality, it's just that every human life is not a map. It's the actual territory that the map can trace. Yeah, that's extremely insightful. I like this kind of middle ground where the influencer culture take that with the expertise of someone who understands the topic and, and meld them somehow. Um, like, what is this middle ground? I like that um, an idea there. Well, and that also a lot makes it easier, I think, to respect the stories of people who have been led to very different conclusions by their personal experience. That, like, you know, I can say, well, I think as a pattern... When, when we talk to over and over and over again to LGBT Christians and say, like, what's helped you maintain your faith? Uh, over and over we hear, you know, the people who treated me well when I came out. But you'll always have that one person who's like, I'm really grateful that my mom said, what if it's just a phase? I don't want you to get trapped in this identity because it turned out that was right. And now I'm happily married to someone of the opposite sex. And maybe I wouldn't have my beautiful family and children if my mom hadn't pushed me in that direction to sort of reconsider. And you don't have to be like, oh, that's fake. You know, you don't have to be like, oh, you're secretly sad. <laughs> you can say, well, it sounds like you found a lot of blessings on that path. All I can say is most people that I've talked to don't. Uh, that that's that makes their lives much harder, but like I'm very grateful that that is how it has worked out for you. I'm curious about your relationship with uh, different parts of the church. What's been your experience with um, those in power, um, whether it's the the actual hierarchy, bishops, priests, or people who are gatekeepers in Catholic organizations or institutions? I'm curious about your experience in in those spaces. So first, I'll just say they don't. My sense is they don't feel themselves to be people in power. Um, sometimes in a sort of self-pitying way, sometimes in a way that's very deeply obedient and trying to kind of subordinate themselves to their religious superiors and to the role. You know, and sometimes in the best cases, because they truly have a servant's heart and, you know, would not dare to think of themselves as the ones with the power in that relationship. In terms of kind of how... I don't know if I have a generalization. 
I guess so far I've found people in that kind of gatekeeping position to be extremely aware of their responsibilities. And, but the set of positions that they're pushed to as a result of that awareness seem about the same as in the rest of the church, that that feeling of responsibility can lead you to basically all the same places. And you see, I mean, parents too, right? Parents feel a deep responsibility to their children and that can lead them to do stuff that really backfires and stuff that's really good and stuff that's kind of like neutral (laughs) Uh, or just they flail around in confusion. Yeah, I guess that is kind of how they feel. I don't know that there's a pattern. One of the things I very much appreciate about the Catholic Church is its snail's pace. It doesn't react quickly. It thinks and deliberates and sits and listens and prays. The Church doesn't belong to the left or the right, and it's sometimes both vague and clear all at once. As it's run by humans, it sometimes is at odds with itself. During the pandemic, I listened to Father Mike Schmidt's Bible in a Year podcast for the first time ever experiencing the entirety of the Bible. And what struck me the most wasn't the stories of the heroic or significant individuals, but instead the people of God as a whole. The Bible is a story of a people who have been thinking and deliberating and sitting and listening and praying since the beginning of time, all in an attempt to grow closer to God. This deliberative church can be frustrating when it feels like change is needed now for queer people seeking greater acceptance, for example. But its slow development through the Holy Spirit also prevents swings toward injustice. I asked Eve where she feels the church needs to develop its teachings. Where should this slow needle begin to move? Yeah, I would say there's kind of two areas. Uh, One is And I think both of these are pretty well grounded in scripture, history, theology. Um, One is the thing that I talk about constantly, which is Catholic forms of same-sex love. Uh, What are the ways that two adult people of the same sex can become kin to one another and share their lives in lifelong devotion? That's all real. That's like, that's the covenant of David and Jonathan, like... That's Jesus and John's friendship leading to John being incorporated into the Holy Family. Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. Like, this is not, it only feels innovative because there's been a centuries long gap in public, where public recognition of these, this kind of love was suppressed. Rescuing that, reviving it, seeing how it shifts in under contemporary circumstances. I don't know if there would end up being more developed, you know, ritual forms, maybe not, maybe so, uh, whether they would draw, like, there, there are a wide range of frameworks from the, the pairs of hermits who, or pairs of pilgrim brothers who would go off together, who are un- unrelated, uh, and call one another to sanctity to the Eastern forms of adoptive brotherhood and sisterhood, to Western forms that were typically put in terms of vowed friendship or wedded brotherhood. These are all different ways of thinking about the fact, as far as I can tell, that God calls some people to a deep and holy and lifelong love of someone of the same sex. I don't know what it would look like to delve into that for the church to develop actual kind of like doctrine or to develop in some way sort of her presentation of that but that's something that it seems to me that there's a very very solid foundation my sense of what does it mean for doctrine to develop is like you, that you should be able to find the seeds of a thing uh, and the beginnings of it and develop those beginnings and that i feel like this is like almost a no-brainer and then the other one is when i think about where i would expect the greatest theological work currently to come from like if you look at the medieval world the theology and mysticism tended to come from the religious orders from life in monastic communities or mendicant communities uh and when i think about so what are the equivalent kinds of community that are doing something so necessary in their relationship with jesus that they would be the sources of this kind of thinking what 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 i think of and would like to see is groups that are organized around uh, 
maintaining faith in the face of oppression or abuse from in the name of the church. That theological work is like complex, necessary, and not something that there's a lot of sort of like officially sanctioned, I guess you could say, doctrinal work on as far as I know. That seems like a place where it would be really important for development of doctrine to happen. And again, like plenty of warrant, you know, looking back on even uh, Judas's betrayal. Yeah, I think I think both of those are very reasonable. <laughs> this is my thing. Like, I'm not I'm not a theologian, so maybe so I, I hesitate to go too far. But those both seem like development is already happening and is it's clear where you can you can draw a line is the image that i use a lot can you draw a line from the beginning to now and to the future yeah yeah i I very much appreciate that there there obviously are 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 many catholics who couldn't care less about any of this Um, maybe they have their opinions about this or that or the other thing but it's not something that weighs on them but i think for us who who live in this space what are what are the doors that we can look at that that could potentially open? What are the things that we could kind of take solace in? I'm curious about, uh, as someone, again, who has really accomplished uh, in many ways and, and really prolific in, in your writings and your thinkings, what kind of advice or encouragement would you give to people in this space? And does it differ depending on what their opinion is, whether it's someone who is much less for um, the inclusion of LGBTQ people or people who are maybe all about changing the church doctrine and we got to have gay marriage and all this stuff. What would you say is, is kind of your advice to people in this space? Yeah. Okay. Let me think. So my first thought was the advice that I always give that no one ever takes. Uh, and I didn't take it either. So, Hey, uh, which is you will think that you are ready to give your testimony and begin running your big mouth, uh, well before you actually are ready. Uh, and on some level, that's almost inevitable because the way that you learn things is that you say dumb stuff and then people tell it, like tell you. Um, so it's almost built into the structure. But especially for people who are themselves personally queer in the church, there is a tendency for there to be poster children uh, and for people to want you to represent something greater than yourself in a way that, that puts an enormous amount of pressure on your real spiritual life and you're sort of like your relationship with yourself and with god um on the other hand again like literally no one i've given this advice to has ever taken it so maybe there's a reason for that maybe we have to go through that process of realizing that i've sort of become this kind of public self in a way that is harming like my real self uh the two things i think we can gain from one another across these really big painful divides one is just acknowledgement of the reasons that people's positions feel so hard one uh, and so much in need of defense because there's often a lot of insight there as well as, as personal pain. And then the second one is that in some way, in terms of sides, there's things that each side has tended to focus on that the other side very much has needed also. One side has probably done more to develop a case for the reality of same-sex love and that is the dissenting side. And that is one reason that a lot of people who are, in fact, trying to live in an orthodox way, nonetheless, like, hugely relate to stories and, you know, art uh, and prayers created by people who are not doing that. Um, it's because they acknowledge something that's a reality that we needed to know about. And then by the same token, I do think the category of obedience, uh, which can be massively misused, but which is still a real part of what it means to be Christian. One thing I think has been a huge conversation on the more orthodox side has been, how do I tell the difference between obedience and self-hatred or humility and self-hatred? And that conversation has led, I think, to some places that would be really fruitful for people. You know, it's, it's not my place to tell people who disagree with me what to think or what they, what they should find important. But, I do think that there's a cluster of words, images, associations that link obedience to trust, to humility, to discipline, to a lot of things that people may long for, but also fear and are like, but how can this be used against me? And I think that the community of gay Catholics has done a, has actually done a lot of thinking about that and is starting to come up with ways of articulating 
how do you lean into those longings that we have for trust and for discipline and self-mastery and all those things without cutting off a part of yourself or or leaning or, or self-destruction yeah no that rings true finally then what do you what do you have to look forward to where's their hope i get the sense in you speaking to me that you you really exude uh, a sense of peace <laughs> um that is not often heard from either either you know, when we're talking about LGBTQ issues today, a lot of anxiety around it. There are wonderful people out there who are doing great work that there is a lot of anxiety in their work. Uh, but just in, even in this conversation with you, I get a sense where you you have the sense of peace about you. So where is their hope? Where is this peace uh, come from? Yeah, well, you know, I, you know, when you said that, I was like, well, right. It's, you know, my recommendation, if you want a deep feeling of peace and confidence in the, in God's power and mercy is to develop a life destroying addiction and then you know let him rescue you from that uh that like right i basically that going through alcoholism and recovery was kind of a crucible for me and after that it's just very hard to doubt that god is powerful and loves me um, <laughs> because that was clearly something that i was not able to handle on my own and like for people who've had a much harder experience with that or haven't or ha or can't point to something of that kind in their own lives. Uh, I do nonetheless think that there is a lot of hope, even in very kind of, uh, when I became Catholic, I didn't know or even know of any other queer people who were trying to be both openly gay and like, you know, and happy about that, and also obediently Catholic. And now I think it is much easier to find people who are across a really wide range of experiences and relationships to the church who can kind of navigate that alongside you. I think there's a lot more freedom to tell those stories in ways that, again, aren't sufficient in themselves, but do each add a piece to the puzzle uh, that people need. And I also think there's a lot more openness about vocation that's one place where i think the conversation has shifted in a really positive way that a lot of the conversations that used to be very stale and repressive and about but can you really call yourself gay uh are now shifting much more to you know what's your future gonna look like what is your what, what are the possible ways that you can like have a life of love The church's message of love is at once simple and full of a messiness that comes with being human. What does it mean to love? What does it mean to live a life of love? Especially as a queer person, I find myself gravitating towards things, people, articles, arguments, churches that alleviate anxiety, that open me up, allowing me to live out my call to love more fully. I am a messenger of the church a messenger of the gospel, a messenger of love. Before we wrap up today, I have for you Eve's recommendations. If this conversation is intriguing to you, I think my second gay Catholic book, Tenderness, is probably the best starting point because um, that really delves into the spiritual life and the relationship directly with God. So I read this book, Here at Last is Love, selected poems of Dunstan Thompson. Thompson being a gay Catholic poet, and like I read it because he was a gay Catholic poet, and you know, you have to like wave the banner, support the side. Uh, and then I was like, oh, these are actually really good, <laughs> but I don't, you know, you may not agree, right? But I would throw that out there as an under-recognized source. This interview was written, produced, and edited by Greg Krajewski, who also composed the music. Special thanks to Maxwell Kuzma. If you like this interview, consider supporting Outreach so that we can bring you more content like this. Visit our website, outreach.faith, to donate today. Thank you.